So this could be the gluten epidemic like I've, I've written up here or 10 reasons to stop eating bread. And it's hard to convince people, but I'll show you the science that clearly says we're having far too much gluten and it's contributing a lot to low level health issues of everybody you know. So my message is we need to share this. Okay, to start off with, I'm not dealing with um, the, the one common thing that everybody knows about gluten is celiac disease. And I'm not dealing with celiac disease, I'm dealing with low level other conditions and we call those non-celiac gluten sensitivities. And these are the reactions that people have. They don't have the allergic reaction that they do in celiac disease that sends them straight into a hospital or anaphylactic shock or any serious issue like that. It's much lower level. It can be serious, but it's much lower level and much more diverse and wide in their community. And so we've got these non-celiac gluten sensitivities. And a large part of this are the gut issues that people don't realize and they've just got them. So where does this all start? Well, it starts with the two main forms of glutens. Glutens and something called gliadins that you're getting wheat. Now you also get the cousins of that in rye and barley and there's a little bit of argument over oats and so on, but you get other variations. So in a sense, it's really hard to avoid gluten because of the type of diets that we're consuming nowadays. And so we've got these, but on top of that, we've got other issues that we need to consider. For example, this is my plus sign here, we've also got wheat allergies and reactions to wheat. So it's not just the gluten, there are other factors in there. We've got glyphosate, which I'll touch on briefly, which is a pesticide or a herbicide used on wheat and many other crops. And that in itself can cause problems. So a lot of people say, oh, it's not gluten, it's not gluten, it's glyphosate. Well, it, it is gluten and glyphosate may be contributing to that and or other issues. And there are a few other things in there as well. So all of these are linked in with the wheat gluten problems. And it all begins 10,000 years ago when we moved to uh, uh, urban environments, we created cities and towns. And so we had all the farms around the agricultural revolution. We moved away from hunting and gathering, which meant that we had very little grain, very, very little. And it was a wild stock grain. And then as we've evolved, we've altered the, the wheat to make it much more productive and much more suitable to the environment we're growing in. So what, what has happened is 10,000 years ago, we started eating wheat. And even then we would have had some celiac, we would have had some non-celiac, sensitivities, we do have other gut issues and so on, but it probably wasn't recognized. But it was also different because it, they would have had lower levels of gluten and they would have consumed lower levels of wheat and so on that we do. But what's happened is over the last 100 years in particular, in the, in the past 40, 50 years, we've been able to breed up wheat much quicker. So we're talking about changing the breeding, not through genetic engineering, but just through using genetics to understand it, they can breed up wheat really quickly now. And one of the things they want to do with wheat is get the protein content up. Now, you ready? Glutes are the major protein in wheat. So they, they're trying to get that up because the more they get that up, the better it sells on the market, the more money they make and so on. Only thing is it's worse for the consumer. Better for the farmer's pockets, which is great, but not good for the consumer's health in general. So what we've got is these wheat breeding programs that have happened over the last 50 years in particular to increase the gluten content. Now that hasn't happened all around the world, which is one of the reasons why when people say they go to Europe, they actually don't have gut issues. Yeah, I've known dozens of people who said, look, when I, I've, I've, I've got all these reactions in the gut, uh, back home, I have to be gluten free. When I go over there and I have their French loaves and I don't react to it because they've got different strains that, and there's not so much emphasis on the development like we do have in some of the agrarian countries like Australia, um, uh, uh, America and uh, Ukraine and so on. But coming, coming back here, so they've got breeding programs that speed up it. But then we've got agricultural practices now, which also increase the gluten content. And the first of those is nitrogen. Now, nitrogen is the main fertilizer that they put on wheat crops. And nitrogen is the building block of the protein, of gluten. Literally the building block of all proteins. All proteins have nitrogen in it, and so it's a building block of gluten. And gluten um, increases with the nitrogen. So more nitrate, nitrogen fertilizers, 
the more gluten there is. But also glyphosate, Roundup, that's that herbicide I mentioned a little bit earlier, Roundup also becomes a problem because Roundup increases the gluten content as well, not to mention its own problems. And that's another video I'll do all together, the, the role of Roundup in our health issues and so on. But clearly glyphosate and nitrogen, as a result, in all the breeding programs, we've got much more gluten in the wheat that we're consuming. But then we get to probably the biggest factor here, and that is the increased amounts of gluten-containing foods that we eat. And the first one of those is we now have, as a result of the, the marketing campaign over the last 60, 70 years for breakfast foods, cereal breakfast foods. I like to call them cereal killers personally, but cereal breakfast foods. You know, Kellogg started manipulating everyone, telling you have all these, and so much people are consuming so much wheat in their wheat products in their breakfast at the moment. Then they have them in lunch and then they have them in dinner. And historically, that was never so. It was about a third or even a quarter of that amount. And all the research has shown literally over the last 60 years that the amount of wheat continues, the amount of gluten we're exposed to and wheat we're exposed to goes up every 10 years. It just keeps going up and up and up. So my message is one of the first things we can do is just reduce our consumption of wheat. I know it's pretty hard because first of all, they're addictive. There's a very strong addictive com, you know, component of it. But the second part is that there are, you know, we're, we're educated, literally brainwashed into using these products for breakfast. People say, well, what do you have for breakfast? Well, you go back and look at developing countries around the world and they have the same thing for breakfast, lunch and dinner, variations of it, lots of variations for it. Um, I've, I've recently, you know, travelled and I would have a curry for breakfast and I would have whatever it is. We need to think differently than the way we've been marketed to. So the first one is increased consumption. We're eating a lot more of it, but also it's an additive. Gluten is now put in so many products and it's not just put in as a gluten to increase the protein content or increase the manipulative ability of the food, but also Right, it also because it's got its own properties there and it, it, it changes it, it increases the, the, the protein content. And you know, so my message is we need to look at the, all those labels too. And if you're serious about it, you read the label and you say wheat or gluten added. It doesn't always say um, gluten, it can say wheat protein and the wheat protein, which is gluten, which is what we're trying to get rid of. So then it comes back to the next level. So we've got increased levels of exposure to it. The next level is our inability, our increased inability to be able to deal with it. And most people don't realize that your gut is, the health of your gut will determine how able you are to digest or not. Now, if you don't digest, now digestion is the process that your body uses to break things down. Fermentation is what your microbes use in the gut. So in digestion, it starts in the mouth and then it goes in the, into the stomach, digestion with your enzymes in the small intestine, and they break everything down. And they break everything down. The main part, obviously, is the stomach. And what's really, really um, critical about glyphosate, oh, sorry, <laughs> gluten, is it's very hard to digest. So already, gluten is hard to digest. So you eat it, you've got a really healthy stomach, oh, I can't digest it properly anyway, it goes through into the small intestine, large intestine, starts to cause irritation, inflammation, and gut type issues, which I'll be mentioning later. So already it does that. And that's just because it's hard to digest. And it's hard to digest simply because of the type of glutens and gluten's and we're bred. We're literally bred <laughs> the protein content of, of the, the foods in the wheats and so on, that are, that are almost impossible for us to digest properly now, which means it then goes in and causes fermentation issues in the large intestine. Okay, processing makes that gluten even harder to digest. So when you cook it and bake it and do all those extra things, it increases or decreases the digestibility of it. So all of these things are little steps. There's a few percentage and a few percentage, but they're all these extra steps that make it so that without any doubt, you're going to end up with more gut issues as a result of gluten. Now, here is the next one, and that's the stomach. The stomach is the main part for digestion of proteins. And for the stomach to do that, it needs a strong acid, hydrochloric acid, around about one, a pH of one to two. Now, I've got... Um, 
uh, some posts up on that. So please watch the videos on that so you can understand it. I don't have to repeat myself here. But what you want is a strong stomach acid because the strong stomach acid opens up the proteins and enables you to digest them because they're locked away. They're big molecules and they're locked away and, and, and the hydrochloric acid opens them up and then the enzymes can start to break them down. Now, what doesn't happen in this day and age is um, we have so many people with low stomach acid. Now, what's the first indicator of that? The first indicator is reflux. Yes, it's not too much stomach acid. Again, watch the video on that. It's not too much stomach acid. It's not enough. Bloating, other gut-related issues, may be as a result of low stomach acid. Now, if you've got low stomach acid, that means you can't digest the gluten properly. And as a result, then you're getting more gluten going into your large intestine and fermenting. Um, uh, medications can alter that, things like your proton pump inhibitors. These are the ones they give to people with reflux to lower the acid, even though the major problem they have is too low on acid. Oh, something's wrong with that. The system is broken. So my message here is very simply, you need to increase your stomach acid to have the right digestion. Those drugs have serious and even deadly side effects in terms of increased mortality. So we've got the other medications, and of course, just big meals. Uh, if you have a big meal, a double whammy whopper burger or whatever it is with all that bread and gluten in it, and it's a huge meal, your stomach is producing digestive enzymes and hypochloric acid to try and digest it. Now, normally it would have a smaller meal and normally it would have foods that are slightly acidic anyway, that your veggies and your, and, and your, uh, your greens in particular, your bitters, that's everyone being told you don't have bitters and things like that. That's uh, something probably from a hundred years ago that, that a lot of people have adopted or readopted now. And we know we have these meals that are just big absorbers of the hydrochloric acid. And as a result, your stomach goes to neutral, a pH of about four or five or even six, and it sits there for four or five hours, not digesting. Now that has lots of issues. You know what they are. And my message is get off them. You can't have these big over-processed meals without having stomach issues and gut issues very soon in your life. So big meals are, are, you know, try to lower, have smaller meals, allow for the digestive process to work properly. Now, as a result of all of those, you're getting more gluten going through into your large intestine where it's going to ferment and cause problem. So that then takes us on to your, your intestines, your small intestines, that's a squiggly bit that comes straight out of your stomach and then onto your large intestine, which is the bit that kind of goes up from here across and then down. And that is where all the bacteria work is done. And you've often heard of that, people call it the microbiome. And that's what they're referring to, largely large intestine and small intestine. We have a microbiome everywhere on our skin, in our eyes, everywhere has a microbiome. It looks after our health and well-being. It's all related back to our gut microbiome. But our gut microbiome is often in a state of dysbiosis. If you live in the 21st century, you've probably got dysbiosis. That is where your gut isn't functioning properly. The ratio or the balances of the microorganisms isn't right. Now, it's not as though are they good or bad. It's the balance. And what you want is the biggest type of spread of microorganisms, bacteria primarily, but fungi, even viruses and so on, in your gut, another one called Achaea, and they all work together. And so it's not good or bad. It's about having that diversity and more of the better ones and less of the ones that may cause a problem. So with that in mind, because we live in the 21st century, we've got things like antibiotics, and if you've taken antibiotics on a regular basis, I'm talking uh, uh, you know, once or twice a year, then that's a regular basis. That causes gut dysbiosis, which means your fermentation in your gut isn't going to go the way you necessarily want it to. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, uh, chemicals. Oh, by the way, kids, uh, I think the stats of kids is that most children up to the age of two or three have two or three doses of antibiotics a year. So they are really starting out from a bad position an unhealthy gut position. And I really do predict serious gut issues in the future, unless we start to address them now. Then you've got chemicals, the everything we breathe, the, the toxic chemicals, the cosmetics and personal care products, everything you put on your skin, even your hair, not for me, of course, but uh, all of those things are contributing to poisoning your gut. And they're all the anti, everyone has to wa wash with antibacterials going into supermarkets and everything now, ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous, because as soon as you touch your clothes and everything else, you're going to be contaminated with bacteria again. It's stupid, but it does destroy your gut microbiome. 
which is a real problem that nobody seems to be mentioning. And then we've, we've got lots of stress and other factors in the 21st century lifestyle. So that comes, brings us back to dysbiosis. Now, dysbiosis is out of balance. And then as a result of that, you end up with lower levels of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. Now, you've heard of those before because they're the ones you get in the yogurts and your probiotic supplements and all those you've been told, oh, have more of these, have more with the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, and they're fantastic. And there's lots of variations in the different types of lactobacillus and bifido, and they're absolutely fantastic. Everything, all the research I read on from every possible condition you could imagine, from arthritis to gout to diabetes type 1 and 2, uh, all links back to having a healthy gut with these bacteria, lactobacillus and bifida. Unfortunately, in dysbiosis, you have a decrease in the, the, the well-balanced good, the best type of bacteria. Now, as a result of that, um, these bacteria also digest, they're, they're called gluten digesters. So they actually ferment um, gluten into a less toxic compound so it can be absorbed and used as a nutrient. They're the two main ones, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, but they're already low because of dysbiosis. So it means that, hold on, you can't do it properly. So it actually lowers the ability to actually ferment or digest gluten. So if they ferment it and you can finish digesting it and absorbing it into your system. It lowers that amount. So what we want to do is improve the lactobacillus. Unfortunately though, gluten, also works to decrease. It acts as a poison. So on the one hand, the lactobacillus can break it down and ferment it. On the other hand, is that gluten poisons the lactobacillus and the bifido. So their numbers are down. And the research shows that people eating, consuming a regular diet with large amounts of gluten in have 10 times less of the lactobacillus and bifido bacteria. 10 times less. So that's going, wow. It's time to, hold on, can I replace them with probiotics? No, you can replace them by getting off the gluten because that's what's poisoning them. The gluten becomes a poison for, you ready? The lactobacillus and bifido, the good balanced bacteria in your gut. And it also increases a whole raft of other ones, other bacteria, I'm not even gonna go into them, but the ones, for example, you would know as clostridia. Now, some of those clostridia aren't so bad, some are even good, but it increases the nastier ones and they're linked with diarrhea and gut issues along the way. So we're getting more, because of that imbalance in the gut microbiome, we're getting more gluten exposure as a result of the way it poisons the lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. So you understand that, and we go onto the, onto the next part of that is, okay, so what else in our diet helps a good bacteria or hurts a good bacteria or works with gluten? And that's a group of chemicals called polyphenols. Now again, very few people know this and understand this whole picture. But the polyphenols are all the colors and the long names you see in all the food. Now you've heard of resveratrol in red wine, but there's not enough in red wine to have a real benefit. But you get it in all of your foods, in onions. Onions, oh, onions have one called quercetin. Brilliant, brilliant. Has so many effects around there, but one of the effects of all these polyphenols is they are a secondary feed for all your healthy gut microbiome. So if you want a healthy gut microbiome, it's a diversity of fibers. Start off with looking at K-fiber, um, a diversity of fibers and the polyphenols. So the polyphenols feed the gut microbiome, make them healthier, more lactobacillus, more bifidobacteria. Um, and as a result of it, you end up with a healthy microbiome, which then is able to digest better. And the polyphenols are also able to block gluten. They actually help with the digestion of gluten by actually locking them away and not being able to then be absorbed and cause problems on the gut wall. So polyphenols have that double edged benefit again. So again, improving the gut microbiome and secondly, locking away the gluten so that they don't cause any and helping digest the glutens even better. It's a win-win-win situation. So the message is you need more polyphenols. Now the problem is, We've removed most of the polyphenols from the food. When you have wheat, you have polyphenols. Raw wheat has polyphenols in it, but we've removed it in all of the processing. Uh, all of the polyphenols come in the veggies, nuts, seeds, herbs, spices, and the vast majority of people don't eat all of those as well. So some of the polyphenols that they've actually found that block, you ready? Block gluten are um, apple. Some of the polyphenols coming out of 
uh, of apple, um, uh, curcumin, one that you find in turmeric, and a, a, a raft of one in ch uh, chocolate, cacao, raw chocolate. So there's a nice one. Yeah, have some chocolate to actually block the gluten and reduce some of the gluten issues. So you can see how this works together as a picture. And then the final part of all this is as a result of all of that exposure here, what we've got is more and more inflammation. Now, inflammation is the cornerstone of every single form of chronic illness, from cancer, heart attacks, strokes, everything, diabetes, arthritis, inflammation is the cornerstone, the key. And if we can lower the inflammation, we're actually reducing our risk of exposure to all of these chronic illnesses. And, and the major source of, one of the major sources of inflammation in the body is the gut. And so what, what gluten is doing is it's increasing inflammation dramatically. And that inflammation is then leading to little holes being made in the gut wall. And we call it leaky gut or gut permeability or membrane permeability. And the gluten and other poisons, for example, one called LPS from the wrong type of bacteria, um, uh, the, 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 as a decay of, of gram-negative bacteria, they produce lipopolysaccharides, LPS, and that goes in and they cause inflammation around the whole body. So as a result of that, we end up with health issues, mainly in the gut as a res result of uh, gluten, but also throughout the whole body, which I'll, I'll show you now. So what are the symptoms of non-celiac Gluten sensitivity. So we're excluding the celiac group, okay, which is serious, about 1% of the population. That's very, very serious, and that can react to incredibly small amounts of gluten. But we're dealing with that bigger group of the population, potentially up to 50%, who may be reacting to gluten. And so my message here is, again, it's not celiac. The first thing is that it happens is that because of the gluten, the increased gluten that I've already explained, it goes into the gut and causes dysbiosis and inflammation. That dysbiosis and inflammation means that the wrong type of bacteria are growing, they cause inflammation, and they can send chemicals, literally all those chemicals pass through the gut wall into the blood and around the body. So it can actually manifest as symptoms just about anywhere in the body, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the second part is that as these, these um, the gluten themselves because you've got leaky gut where increased permeability of the gut wall, gluten itself can get through and start to trigger some reactions. So we've got different poisons now going into the blood, causing reactions. So we're going to see some systemic things throughout the whole body. And we're, of course, we're going to see a lot more gut issues, which is the, the best way to measure this. So we've got these. So we've got our gut symptoms and our metabolic symptoms. Coming over here, the first of the gut symptoms start off as bloating. And I have so many people tell me about bloating. Now, it's really important here also to understand that kids can often be reacting to gluten sensitivity. Um, by the way, kids don't develop their full digestive enzymes and, en and digestive systems till after two years of age. So kids should not be, and I've already highlighted that, should, kids should not be getting large amounts of gluten before two years of age, before they can even start to try and break it down. Coming back to this though, Kids will also show these type of symptoms and they'll just go and say, I've got a sore tummy. And one of the things I've found is that all of my talks, people will come up and say, look, I've just taken my kids off. I've got off, I've, my family's got off gluten and everyone has improved. So that's the best and really, the really only test you can do for this. But we've got bloating, we've got abdominal discomfort and pain. And for a child, the problem is there that they don't know that, you know, they say, oh yeah, I just feel sick, mummy, daddy. You know, I just feel sick in the tummy and it hurts and I've got pain. Constipation, very, very common. And one of the reasons is because with poor digestion, all the chemicals, it's not just about fiber constipation, it's about the chemical messengers. And the wrong type of bacteria send the wrong messages to hold on to the toxins in the bowel and just, uh, and so on. And they don't allow the good messages, the right pH and the right chemicals like melatonin that are produced in the gut to actually work their, their, their magic. They do move everything through. So it's not just about increasing fibre, although fibre can have a big play in it. So you've got constipation, you've got visceral sensitivity, which is really just um, people reacting to other types of foods and so on. So they, they start to become more sensitised to different foods um, and, and different things that they take in as a result of already the inflammation that's going on in the gut. Diarrhea, 
So I've mentioned constipation, diarrhea. We've had people who go from diarrhea to constipation to diarrhea to constipation, and they just cycle through these, these mechanisms, unfortunately, until they get off gluten, at least for a trial for a couple of weeks. Then you've got flatulence um, and IBS. IBS is inflammatory, um, uh, sorry, irritable bowel syndrome. And that's very, very common. And what we find is that there's a large crossover between the symptoms of IBS and gluten sensitivity. In, in fact, in the studies where they've got a group of IBS patients and they've put them on a gluten-free diet, in some cases, 50% of them improve their symptoms. Now, previously they were diagnosed as IBS, but now they're diagnosed as gluten sensitivity, maybe slash IBS. And the treatments obviously very different. The first one is obviously, I've mentioned a few times, getting off gluten, but there are other parts of the program that I will teach you. So it's the IBS symptoms, typical general bowel symptoms, that these we've already mentioned. Now, one of the other factors here is because the toxins are getting into the blood and because the gluten is getting into the blood, it's able to go to the different places and cause problems. Now, if the toxins get in there and they get through the, the uh, uh, leaky gut, they can get into the brain and cause leaky brain. So you'll end up with things like cognitive impairment, focus and concentration, memory issues. People call it brain fog. And again, one of the simplest strategies with brain fog is to say, okay, come on, let's, if I've got that, there's a couple of other things you can do, and I'll do a presentation on that one too, but um, is to get rid of that gluten for a period to see if it improves. The simplest strategy, okay? You've got fatigue, general muscle fatigue because of inflammation and weight gain. A couple of papers have demonstrated that increasing gluten content leads to an increase in weight gain, at least in mice and rats. And of course, we can't do the experiment with people yet, but the, the early studies are showing that. So it comes back to a really simple question. How do we reduce our exposure to gluten? And it's not just about the diet. Everyone will say, oh, go on the diet and so on. But as I've already highlighted, there are a number of mechanisms that increase the amount of gluten you're actually exposed to. So what we're talking about here is first, a gluten-free diet. And I'm not gonna go into the details. There's a lot of information out there, uh, except that it's very hard to be 100% gluten-free. So the thing is just, Manage it, get as low as you can. And if you don't have any of these symptoms, just reduce your gluten exposure. Cut out some of that grain. I know it's addictive, isn't it? It's very addictive, those breads and those rolls and everything. Try sourdough here. Sourdough, it's actually fermented by the lactobacillus bacteria. So it actually starts to break down the gluten in the bread already, and then you get it in. Hence why sourdough doesn't cause as many problems. So. Go gluten-free, um, watch the, the more of the grains that, that are processed, try to avoid anything that's processed. The probiotics, prebiotics, and postbiotics, uh, again, I've already highlighted how they will break down the gluten in the small and large intestine. So it's great to have them, particularly lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. I don't have a particular brand or strain, um, but the probiotics, absolutely. And this is going to be an ongoing regime. So if you, even if you go gluten-free, get on these anyway. And one of, one of the things there is, uh, the, it, it, fixing the gut isn't just about probiotics, okay? There's a whole mechanism, a whole, I've already got a video up there on, on YouTube, please watch it because it'll give you an insight into it all. And then you've got, Polyphenols, you remember I talked about the things in green tea, uh, green uh, apple um, polyphenols, uh, chocolate, actually cacao, uh, polyphenols have all been shown to actually reduce the exposure to gluten in the intestines while it's been fermented. So it's a great one. And then improved digestion. Now that one comes back to the stomach and the whole gut. But the first thing is one of the simplest strategies people can do to improve digestion is try some apple cider vinegar. Again, there's a, a video on that and it explains why apple cider vinegar, because it's got probiotics, prebiotics, postbiotics, it's got some polyphenols in it, it's got some minerals in it, and it increases the stomach acid. Watch the video uh, on that, you'll, you'll, you'll be amazed, and it's incredibly cheap. See, fixing the gut isn't expensive until you get too far along and you think, well, you know, what do I do? Well, this is where you start. And then with improving digestion, anything, taking your time, eating less, eating smaller meals, all of those things. And again, a lot of information on this. Uh, you've got a huge amount of information here that you have to take away. Um, I hope you literally can digest it, excuse the pun. 
Um, if you like this, share it with your friends, please. A lot of people have these issues and they don't know, and I just want to get this science out there. I'm science-based. Follow me on YouTube. We've got a website, drdingle.com, um, with our other lots of bits and pieces in our books. So I look forward to being able to share more information with you.